We tell our spouses what they want, we think they want to hear. We tell our kids what they think we think they want to hear. And, and just to be really honest with you, a lot of people standing in church telling people what we think they want to hear. And it's just, I'm not being overly critical. I'm just being honest because it's happening. And, and I, I have always done my best in the t- almost 10 years that we've been here in this church to make sure that it's not about that. That sometimes I ruffle your feathers. Actually, God's ruffling your feathers. I'm just the messenger. And, and I'm okay with that. And I think those of you, that, man, there's a ton of people been on this whole ride. I think you know that I love you. And, and, and when we say things and, and, and we do things, it's because we want all of our, mine included, our relationships to grow in, in God. We, we, we want that to happen. But that happens when we're, when we're truthful, when we speak truth and we live truth and do the best that we can to do that. But so many times it's about making people feel good or making people feel bad. Why can't we just speak the truth? You know, I was thinking today, you you know where one place is that where more lies probably are told than any other place? This is just kind of a side note because I I just, it just popped into my, a job interview. A job interview, right? I mean, think about it. You go into a job and you interview and you sit down and what are we trying to do? We're trying to impress the person across from us to get the job, right? So in essence, we're trying to, to say the right things, what we think they want to hear. Why? So we can get a job. Right? And I can promise you, just being real, that half of that stuff is just made up baloney. I was reading a book not too long ago, and, 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 just, and it was about, and honestly, it was about job interviews, and, and it was challenging people that, that actually have to do them to, to get away from just sitting in front of a desk or sitting across from someone and asking all these, these prefabbed questions. One of the suggestions in, in, a, in a job interview is if you had kids... To load them up in your minivan with your kids and take them to Walmart and do the job interview on site at Walmart. Because you find out really quickly how they deal with stressful situations. You find out really quickly how they will deal with having to just instantly having to change directions and do something different that you didn't plan on, on doing. Getting them out of that element that, that someone has, has got all the right answers in their brain and putting them into a life situation to where they have to function and be real. Why can't we do that all the time? So, oh, Pastor Ron, I got a lot in my closet. They don't want to go to Walmart with me and my kids. <laughs> They'd be seeing me smacking them. Like, Shut up. Get. Put that back. Walking out. Where'd you get that? I wanted it. Get that. Kids stealing candy. <laughs> we just be real. So this morning, we're going to continue that journey. We're going to dive in. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and, everybody say and, and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall. I'm going to back up before I keep going. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. Hearing is one thing. Hearing and doing is something different. Let's keep going. Keep going. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Great was its fall. It wasn't just a tiny collapse. The Bible said it fell and great was its fall. Our statement of truth this week, directly out of scripture, obedience is greater than sacrifice. Obedience is greater 
than sacrifice. We talked many times before that it's not enough just to hear God's word, but we have to act on it. It's not enough just to come here on a Sunday morning or every Sunday morning for that matter, and hear what God has to say. We are here to hear it and then do it. Hear it and put it into action. By the way, to hear some of that on a Sunday morning, you have to be here on a Sunday morning. Amen? Anybody watch my CPC Minute this past week? The one entitled, Get Out of Bed? Anybody watch that? About... 90% of you need to go home and get on our YouTube channel and watch it. Wasn't being, I'll just give it to you right here. Remember last week we talked about the lies of the devil and how he'll whisper in our ears? Remember last week we were talking about how you wake up on a Sunday morning and you're tired and you hear that little voice that say, it's okay, you just stay there and you just stay home and you just, you just rest. And, and listen, I said, and I'll say again, everyone deserves to rest. I deserve to rest on a Sunday morning. Sometimes we just have to have that. But if you lay out one week, the next week you're going to be tired. You're going to hear that little voice. It says you're tired. It's okay, you're tired. And then the third week, and then the fourth week, and before you know it, you're not coming anymore. And it's not that you don't love God, and it's not that you don't love Jesus, but I'm just going to be real. This is a side sermon. I'm on a soapbox. Just deal with it. You need us, and we need you. The Bible says, do not forsake the gathering together of his saints. Don't stop coming to church. It's not just an hour and 15 minutes of, your, of, of just your life to say that you've been to church. It's listening to God's word, studying God's word. It's praying together, worshiping together, laughing together, crying together, battling together. We need each other. So get up and get out of bed on Sunday morning. Here's the second part of that. The second part. If you know someone, if you know someone, and I'm not saying they necessarily fall in this line, but if you know somebody... And they used to sit in a seat in this church, and they're not sitting in a seat in another one. And you know them, you know them. How about just a friendly text? Gosh, I miss you. Get out of bed. It's okay to be a little bold. You can make it lighthearted. Why don't you get out of bed on Sunday morning? It's going to be good. Give them a chance. Give them a chance. Because this is what I know. You think Satan's little voice is going to stop talking? How about let's, let's raise the volume on God's voice. Amen? Amen. All right, here we go. Obedience, to follow the commands of. It's one of the hardest things for Christians to do is be completely obedient. It is. It's one of the hardest things for Christians to do is be completely 100% obedient. How many of you, please do not raise your hand unless God just tells you to, and then you have to be obedient. How many of you have had God tell you to do something, sometimes over and over and over and over again, and you just couldn't pull the trigger? You just couldn't do it for whatever reason. And you knew it was God. There was no question it was God. And he was speaking it to you, and he spoke it to you again, and then he would speak it to you again, and you would come, fear might have kept you from it, uncertainty might have kept you from it, lack of faith, you didn't believe in yourself, didn't believe God would really ask you to do that. But he did, and you know it, and no matter how much you try to push that to the side, it's just like, oh, God, would you just stop? Anybody ever done that? Anybody ever just looked up and said, okay, God, please, just could you just be quiet? Please. I don't need that right now in my life. I don't need to do that. I don't have time. It's too hard. Please, God, just find someone else. For whatever reason, we just couldn't do it. Sometimes we might even get right up to that point. And man, we're just about ready to take that last step. We're just about ready to do it. And we get to, I mean, we psych ourselves up and we get there. I'm going to do it. I can't, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then we get right there to it. And it's just like, oh, I can't do it. You know what that made me think of? 
Guys, I'm gonna pick on you when you was remember way back in when you was like in your early teens and, and you had that first little girlfriend and she gave you your, her number and you would go home and you would get on the phone and you would dial that number and you would and, you, and as soon as you would dial it, you'd hang it up. And then you got a little braver and you would dial it and you would listen for the first ring and then you would hang it up. And then you would, you would psych yourself up again and then you would dial that number again and then you would wait for her to pick up the phone and say hello and then you hung up. You just couldn't do it. Everything inside of you wanted to just utter a word. Sometimes you'd do it and they'd say hello and you'd be so froze you'd just be like. And then they would hang up. It's kind of like that. You want to do it bad. You want to do what God's t- asking you to do bad. You want to listen. You want to obey. You, you, you want to follow through. And it's just like, oh, let me try again. Oh, I just can't. And that's what we do. That's what we do. Obedience. We do that with God all the time. 1 Samuel chapter 15, this is your reading assignment this week. I'm going I'm to read a couple of verses from here, but 1 Samuel chapter 15, it's your reading assignment this week, read the whole story. I'm going to skim it and go through um, most of it as I tell it to you. But this is one of the key verses in, in verse 22. But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. Now let me go back in this story just a little bit and see what scripture says and again i'm skimming it you go read it okay go home and read it god spoke through samuel to saul to go to attack the amalekites and when he said this he said destroy everything i mean everything this is one of those brutal moments in scripture where you read this and go really yeah he did god said it he said you go and you destroy the amalekites you destroy men women children every animal you don't leave anything you go just take care of business. Wipe them out. That's what, that's what God said. But the problem with this is when Saul and, and he led the army in and, and, and they spared Agag, or however you say his name. And they also took back with them some of the best and finest animals. Now, everything else they wiped out. So pretty much 97.2% of everything, that they, they did, he did it. He was obedient. And from the outside looking in, you look at that and go, well, well he did a pretty good job. I mean, what's, what's wrong with sparing a life? What's wrong with, with falling short? Because everything else that, that he did, he did. So when Samuel showed up, Saul was like, man, I did what the Lord wanted. I did it. And Samuel was like, well, then why do I hear the animals? If you did everything that God said for you to do, why why do I hear those sheep? Why do I hear the cows? Why do I hear all that stuff? If you truly did what God said, why do I hear all that stuff? Saul said, well, I took all that stuff so I can make sacrifices to God. It was one excuse. And these excuses continue to roll, by the way. Oh, well, well, I just took that so I could give it back to God. But get, didn't God say to do this? That's what you were supposed to do to give? Well, 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 but we had to have the finest of, of these animals. We just, they were perfect and, and they would make great sacrifices. So, so this, is what, this is what I did. And that's when Samuel said, your sacrifices mean nothing. If this is the kind of sacrifice you're going to talk about, he says, your sacrifices mean nothing because you didn't obey God. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. And again, some may say, well, Saul pretty much obeyed God. He pretty much did everything. So what's the big deal? But with God, I believe, and according to his word, that when he speaks something, he requires 100% obedience. 100%. Not 99%. As good as 99.9% is. And guys, this is where it gets hard for Christians. It's hard to, to give that extra. We can give the 90 plus percent just fine. It's that little 0.1% or 0.2% or those little things that we just struggle giving that, that full amount, being completely obedient. 
doing everything that God wants you to do. Just last week in, in, in Sunday service, I stood here at the end of worship, and, and, and this happened while I was singing, and God was speaking in my, I'm telling you, almost audibly, almost audibly, to just keep going. Keep the worship team up, keep, keep Christina playing, this is where I want you to go. And I, with everything that's honest inside of me, I battled while we were singing that song in my head. But God, that's different. God, I, I don't know. God, is that you or is that me? I promise you that's what was going on. Until it, that voice just got so loud, it's just like, okay, I, I, we, this is what we're doing. God, if this is what you want to do, then, then, then do it. And listen, it wasn't anything that I did, but I'm telling you, when we get out of the way and we let God do what God wants to do, then the God who's our, we always pray, God, show up. God's already here. Don't we do that? I've done it. How many, I can't even tell you the amount of times I pray, God, would you just please show up? He's already here. We just need to get our rear ends out of the way and let him do what he wants to do. That's obedience. And if it means whatever, then that's whatever. Play for hours. For hours. Obedience. God wants full obedience. See, it says Saul and his army spared the best of everything. They couldn't destroy them. But everything that was despised and weak... They totally destroyed. You know what that says to me? It's easy to do the easy things. That's, what, that's when I read that. It's easy to do the easy things. Right? He took the army in. God said, destroy everything. And he looked and he saw the weakest of the weak of people and animals. And everything. <laughs> took care of it. No problem. But it's when it gets tough. It's when it's that extra step. It's when it's that extra little thing. It's when it's going above and beyond. And when, it's doing, when you're doing something, God's asking you to do something that you've never done before. Doing something that you're uncomfortable doing. Saying something that you're uncomfortable saying. Inviting somebody to church. Picking up the phone with that person that needs to get out of bed on a Sunday morning. And sending them the text that says, I love you. Church is great. Get out of bed. Right? It's easy to go invite the person. Hey, it's easy to go to the person that comes to church almost every single Sunday and say, don't miss church on Sunday. Isn't it? But it's hard to go to the one that hasn't been here for a while. Why? Because we don't want to offend them. We don't want to upset them. We get this in our head. Well, I don't want to offend them. I want them to be my friend. I want them to be my friend too. I do. But more than them being my friend, I want them to hear something from God that potentially could change their life today and their eternity forever. Is it worth that? Because I can promise you this, you're sitting in this church today because somebody, and it might have been a mama or a daddy that whipped your tail every Sunday morning to get you out of bed and get you to church. Well, thank God for the mama and the daddy that did that, amen? But you're here today because somebody, somebody said, get up. Get out of bed. Come with me. It matters because you matter. Somebody was obedient. Somebody listened to the voice of God and then acted on it. Somebody was, a, was a, not only a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word. It's easy to do the easy things. And then we think we've done something because we've done the easy part. Saul was like, I've carried out the Lord's instructions. And I'm not saying that the easy things aren't important because they are. But when we obey the easy and leave out the tough, then are we really being truly obedient? Matthew 25, 21 says, if we're faithful over the little things, then God will make us faithful over much or more. We are to be faithful over the small things. We are to be faithful over the easy things. But when God gives us a challenge, we're to be just as faithful over that challenge as we are something that we can do in our sleep. Yes? 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 Yes. I 
Almost 10 years old we are. Almost 10 years old. I still go back and think about, golly, just all the stuff. By the way, we're going to celebrate this year, I think. I think we should celebrate. I, I do. I think as we get closer to that day, man, we should celebrate. It's a big deal. And not so we can say, oh, look at me, look what we've done. So we can say, oh, look what God's done. Look, what's God, look what God has done. And look what he has done. I say this respectfully, but some of you sitting in this church right now today, you might not have ever sat in another church. And that's not speaking ill towards another church. I believe God puts people in places in the right time in the right places. I, I believe that. The people in the lives that we've got the opportunity to invest in, not only in Ava, Missouri, but all over this country and ultimately this world. That's a big deal. But I can remember, God said, start a church. Okay, we start a church. But I remember when God said, build a church. Some of you do too. Boy, that's a big step. Of, that's just another big step of faith. Didn't have no money, didn't have no land. We just knew what God said, and so that's what we did. It wasn't just start a church. God said, build a church. I gave you the faith and the means to start it. I'll give you the faith and the means to build it. God says, give a dollar. Not, I'm not twisting this into a given money. I'm just saying, God says, give a dollar. We can give a dollar, right? What about when God speaks to you to give a thousand? Oh, wait a minute, God. Hold on. I can do that old dollar thing. I might even go to 10, God. On occasion, maybe 100. 1,000? No. You know I can't do that. Look at my bank account. You know my bills. Sound familiar? We do what's easy. But when God speaks... God says, go to church. Now that sometimes in itself is hard. But in the big scheme of things, if you really look at it, because once you get here, God may say, I need you to serve in wow kids. No, oh, nah. I'm here every Sunday morning, God. I'm doing my thing. I'm worshiping, praying. I give him my dollar. God says, no, I, I need you. But God, I don't really like kids. <laughs> Well, maybe I like kids, they just drive me crazy. I know. But I need you back there. I need you back there. See, we'll come to church. Might get in that, that we might get to that, but if God spoke it to you, I remember when my dad, when we were talking about building, we hadn't even really come to that. I mean, I was just, you know, we were talking about planting this church and doing all this stuff, and I was freaking out. And I'll never forget a conversation I went and had with him one day. And it was out at the house, and he looked at me, and he said, Son, when do you know of a time when God ordained it that it failed? I'll never forgot that. Never will. When? That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. And I drove home. I'll never forget. I drove home. We were living out. Lacey, we was living out off KK out by Lee and Chelsea. And I got to 76 and KK, and I was crying so hard I had to pull off. Right there, as it, you know, it's wide, where it's wide a little bit there. And I pulled off the side of the road, and I just, I had a, just a, one of those conversations with God. And I finally just said, okay. Okay. Whatever you say, let's do it. Let's do it. But sometimes we can come up with excuses. I want to speak to that. Just really, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to kind of whine. In fact, worship team, if you would come on up, that'd be great. Excuses. We're great at making excuses. Saul made excuses to Samuel, and after Samuel rebuked him, you know, it's just like, oh, come on, this isn't right. 
But we make excuses too. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point four of these out just really quickly. And, and maybe something speaks to you. And maybe this is something, that, an excuse that you've been making. And, and if it is, then I want to challenge you today to just let God kind of speak to you. And I'm going to share some scripture with, with some of these. And, and, and hopefully get to this place to where we can make this next step. The first one is this. God, I'm not in the mood. God speaks to you to do something. Say, I'm not in the mood. God, it's a bad day. God, it's a bad day. I got just too much going on. It's just not, I'm I'm just not in the mood. And if we decline to do the right thing when we simply don't feel like it, what kind of honest, honestly, what kind of commitment is that truly to God? What does that reflect? Because if we're not in the mood to obey God, then I can tell you that we need to change our mood and change it quickly. Quickly. What if God wasn't in the mood one day to listen to your prayers? What if he just, what what, what if we went to the throne? What if we went to God and we had this big deal going on and we start praying and all of a sudden we just hear, we get this bounce back and God says, nah, not today. I'm not in the mood to listen to all this today. (laughs) To be honest with you, he probably has the right to say that all the time. But really, what if he said, I'm not in the mood? I'm not in the mood to forgive you today. Oh, there's a big one. I'm not in the mood to forgive you today. I'm not in the mood. Well, I could chase that one, but I'm not going to. So I'm going to go to the next one. God, it's not convenient for me right now. It's not convenient for me right now if we think... We will delay obedience until it becomes easier. We will usually find that it only gets harder. Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 16. Just then a man came up to Jesus and he asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Verse 18, which ones, the man inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then verse 20, all these I've kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then, come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Actually, he went away sad because he probably wasn't willing to give it up. See, we know by this story that this was a, probably a pretty good young man. He probably lived a pretty good life. Because when Jesus started calling out some of the Ten Commandments, he said, oh, I do that. He probably genuinely in his heart, genuinely in his heart, wanted a a, a, a stronger, better relationship or maybe just the beginning of a relationship with Jesus. Why would he ask these questions if not? But when Jesus laid down the last one, When Jesus said, you got to be completely obedient, no, I can't do that. Because it gets hard. It's not convenient. This young man went away because he had great possessions. He had a good life. He probably had all of this stuff. It wouldn't have been very convenient for him to walk away from that in that moment. And listen, if we're not careful, we may reveal that our schedules, routines, and habits are more important to us than God's will. It, it, that can happen. We get to that place to where those things become in, in just a little bit more important. It is possibly possible to be so possessed by our usual routine that sometimes it seems like God has to make an appointment with us. Hmm. Would we like God to treat us the same way? Oh, can't get in today. Sorry. No, I'm booked up for another month. You can get in in about four weeks. But 
like, God, I really, I'm sorry, I don't have time. Obedience is not always convenient. Going to church is not always convenient. Worship team practice is not always convenient. Children's church is not always convenient, especially when you're rocking 12 babies. Youth ministry is not always convenient. In fact, youth ministry can be absolutely chaotic. Chaotic. Man, I'm thankful for people that devote their life into investing in our teenagers and our kids. And I'm stopping what we're doing and going to call someone or go see someone. It's not always convenient. Number three, God, I just don't want to do that. God, I just don't want to do that. God says, I need you. I don't want to do it. This excuse makes me immediately think of Jonah. All right? God told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Preach the word. Tell them about me. Jonah said, I don't want to do that. That's what he said. He said, I don't want to do that. And he didn't do that and ended up in the belly of a fish for three days. Can't imagine that was a great experience. Can you? We might not end up in the belly of a whale, but our disobedience just blatantly saying, no, God, I don't want to do that. I promise you, it'll get us into some really stinky places. Just will. My last one is this. God, I just don't understand why you want me to do that. Now, this is a little bit different than just saying, God, I don't want to do that. This, we add a couple of words to that to kind of help us justify why we're saying, no. God, I just, why do you want me to do that? I don't understand that. God, you want me to do that? And I don't get that because I don't do that. I can't do that. I've never done that before. How in the world could you think that me? One of my favorite couple of verses in the Bible found in Isaiah chapter 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That's God speaking to all of us. Sometimes we may get to understand and sometimes we may not. Sometimes you may step back and question. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with asking God questions. Just don't get stuck on the question and let it keep you from the answer. We may not always comprehend the why. The people of true faith have always trusted God enough to obey. Noah built an ark. Noah built an ark when everyone thought he was crazy. Right? Misfit Moses led a bunch of people out of captivity. Remember, he, he, when God called him, he, he had nothing but excuse. Well, God, you, you can't use me. I stutter. I can't speak. I can't talk to people. You don't want to use me. But he did. Abraham was going to sacrifice his son. Had him tied up on the altar with the knife raised and was ready to get her done. Obedience. Elijah drank from a brook and ate roadkill brought to him by ravens. Because God told him to. Hosea married a prostitute. Ezekiel cooked his food over dung. I think I'll pass on that one, God. But he did it because he was obedient. And I could go on, and I could go on, and I could go on. And I'll say this one because I believe it's the greatest one. Jesus went to the cross... Not too long after he knelt in a garden... And said, Daddy, if there is another way, can we please do that? But if not, but if not, I'll do that. But if not, 
I'll do that. God, if there was somebody else, God, there has to be somebody else. But if not, I'll do it. I'll do it. God, surely, really? Really? But if not, God, I'll do it. I'll do it. You may not understand what God's asking you to do. You don't have to. You just need to obey. It's time to stop the excuses. Stop partial obedience. All or nothing. All or nothing. What did Jesus say in the letter to the church of Laodicea? He said, I'd rather you be cold or I'd rather you be hot. And that what he said? He said, all or nothing. Because he said, if you're lukewarm, if you're just kind of stuck in this halfway thing, I'll spew you out of my mouth. A harsh statement. But that statement with God's all or nothing. Come on, let's get all in. And now, does that mean we're always going to be perfect? No. You know that. Oh, we can sure try, can't we? Can't we try to get better? Can't we try to be more obedient? Can't we try to, to do the things, listen more? Stop with the, by the way, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Stop with the hesitation. It's time to put obedience the forefront what God had been asking you to do what has he been asking you to do that's my question to leave to you today but it is not a question for you to just ponder and hear it is a question for you to hear and then do because what did what did our scripture at the beginning say the one who hears the word and then does it is like the man who builds his house on the rock. And when the winds and the storms and life pounds on you, it will stand. What has God been asking you to do?